156 days ago, Reading were 10 points adrift of safety with seven points after 16 games. Now just look at us. Safe with two games to go. A remarkable turnaround from a remarkable set of people, which has allowed us all to start hoping for brighter days to come. We are Reading Football Club and we won't back down. Welcome to episode 376 of the Tyler Last End podcast. My name, as always, is Ben Thomas. And I'm joined tonight by not one, but two individuals who know a thing or two about Reading Football Club, let me tell you. Bobbins, welcome back to the show, sir. How are you? I'm very well, I think, apart from some techie issues that we had. I'm all good. good. I'm well, all it's good. going to be a very positive one because we are, we're dining out on, uh, on no. safety stew, if you like. On non-regulation mm, yeah. nougat. How about that? Like that? Yeah. Newcastle yeah. yeah. stew. That sounds horrific. Ross, um, have you had your breakfast this morning? Yeah, sure. I've had my breakfast, HP sauce, and on a sausage uh, sandwich. Did you not have uh, potential promotion pancakes? Uh, well, potential or probable. That's the, the question for next season. Exactly. Really, We're already, already casting our beady eyes to next year. Um, talking of, actually, there's, there's no natural link to what I'm going to say next, but I'm just going to say it anyway. Um, ZZ said films, thank Stop you so it. much for your unwavering support in what has been a quite horrendous season, emotionally, physically, metaphorically, literally, all those kind of things. Um, you've been there with us, as always, as you have over the last few years. So thank you so much for uh, your, your sponsorship and for your goodwill and for being generally good eggs, I think, to be honest. Um, <laughs> Right, let's get straight into it, shall we? Let's do the Barnsley recap right now. Come rain or shine, it's time to relive the latest match action with the recap. This podcast is sponsored by ZCZ Films, Reading's oldest ultras. Alrighty, welcome back to episode 376 of the Tyler Sen podcast. We're in we're in good spirits. We're in really, really good spirits because oh, yeah. we have we've survived against all the odds. We have actually been able to survive in this league with two games to spare, which is quite a remarkable achievement, really, when you think about it. Um, let's talk about a, a fairly remarkable game up in Yorkshire against, I say, high flying Barnsley. They weren't in good form or, or, or particularly good form when we when we turned up on Saturday. Um, Twenty one minutes in, uh, Sam Smith uh, scored a header, uh, converted it with his head, as all headers are, uh, across from Aziz, which was which was kind of one bright spot from from Aziz, really. Um, only for us to be pinned back by uh, a McAtee header. It was a game full of headers, boys. It really was. Um, kind of, you know, huffed and puffed. Both teams were were looking like they were potentially going to take some points out of the game. And then uh, on 69 minutes, really, I don't know if you if you guys have, have seen it listening, but Sam Smith wasted a chance from, he was probably about five, six yards out, and he just managed to drag it wide from... I think it was a, a Kelvin oh, yeah. cutback, which was which was not good. He won't like looking yeah. at that one back, you know, today and, and later on in the week. But it didn't matter because on 81 minutes, Lewis Wing scored an absolute shit pinger of a goal. It really was a belter. Um, and we, you know, with, there aren't enough memes, jokes, metaphors to describe this bloke. And we're going to talk a little bit more about him in, in detail later on. But goodness me, what a strike. And it, it just adds to his catalogue, really. Um, there's only one player that's picking up player of the season for me and, and obviously, you know, goal of the season. You could pick any one of his goals and they could probably be goal of the season for us. Um, but yeah, again, we were pegged back. Uh, 83rd minute, another header past the uh, the substitute David Button, which, you know, we could we could talk a lot about David Button, but we're not going to because we're going to be positive today, gentlemen. Um and then, of course, on the 85th... I thought he was all right. Well, Does that count? That's positive. Okay. There you go. I thought he was fine. fine. And not as good as Pereira, but he fine. Was, he was so like vanilla ice cream. Positive. Acceptable. Yes. Yeah. Right, exactly. But not vanilla bean ice cream. Well, yeah. And then on 85 minutes, uh, Jello hit the post, um, which you know could have been curtains for the game. And, and you know we could have been heading to Tibet and this coming weekend in need of, of points to stay up but we managed to see the game out um we're going to we're going to talk a little bit about stats first of all but bobbins i'm going to come to you first um want to pick up on a quote from um el jefe is that how you say it in spanish el jefe. El jefe. 
that what you just said, Robbins, that's good. Um, he said he didn't like the point. Um, do you see where he's coming from with that comment? Yeah, I do. I, I think in the in the main, obviously because we took the lead quite late, but I think overall because we were playing probably in the way that he ultimately wants us to, like he's always said from the outset, you know, he wants us to be the protagonists. Um, and I guess he means away from home as well as at home. And and it looked like, you know, the shackles were well and truly off. And obviously the way that we're playing at the minute in midfield kind of helps that out. The pressing was working well. Um, we were a threat at all times rather than just sporadic. So, so yeah, I can see where he's, he's a bit frustrated because ultimately we put in the kind of performance he's always wanted to see but we've not managed to pull off other than you know fits and starts i mean you know on that note bobbins do you i mean looking at the stats we had five shots on target compared to their nine and we had 17 shots off target um compared to their 14 now i don't know i haven't got you know, as as people that follow me on Twitter know, I don't do stats very well, if ever. I leave those to to Ross. Um, I mean, I, I'd love to know how many shots we've we've managed to get off in in previous games because that seems incredibly high, having seventeen shots off target and you know five on, and and to still score two goals from that. Do you? I mean, were you pleased overall with the performance against the team that? you know, realistically should make the playoffs. And does it, I suppose, broadening that a little bit more, does it give you hope for next season, Bobbins, in terms of what we might be able to achieve if this, you know, the core of this group is kept? Yeah, I, I, I was I was a little bit disappointed in the second half. We looked a little bit kind of a bit ragged and it looked a little bit loose at times, but we were still doing the same kind of things in the first, that we did in the first half. So, and, and, you know, when you compare it to a lot of the earlier games in the season, where we, we never looked in them. We were just, you know, the balls were pinging around and it didn't look as if it had any kind of shape or pattern to it at all. Whereas now you can see what they're trying to do and you see where the players are moving. Um, you, you can sense that they they've now got it within their... their their entire being as a squad to to carry out instructions rather than just hope they can carry them out, if that makes sense. Um, but I think defensively, we looked a little bit misshapen at times. We were still allowing the same old things of crosses going into the box, which obviously led to the second goal. It was things like that. Um, but, you know, you've got to remember this team is in its infancy still. It's not fully formed. Um, it, it's got a lot of parts. I've played a lot of games without too many swap outs. So it's really hard to be hypercritical given everything that we, we know and we've we've experienced ourselves this year. So you've got to come some slack, I think. A 2-2 draw against uh, a playoff side is, is nothing to be sniffed at at all. Yeah, and you're right, you know, you you spot on there in terms of, of actually it being a really positive point because we were pegged back twice, you know, obviously when you take the lead in the game, you know, a number of times you'd, you'd like to walk away with three points, but we, we weren't playing a particularly bad side. And, you know, I want to go back to something that you said at the weekend in your, you know, five things from the game. Uh, in, in the kind of one of the last or second to last paragraphs, she put, there's light at the end of the tunnel and we've been resolute and determined in doing our bit to ensure that we will have as good a chance as any to have a successful and thriving football club again. And that, that for me, was was the main takeaway from your fabulous writing, sir, I have to say, which I read every week. I do read every week. Um, you know, and that, that was a, I thought that was a really, really good point because actually what... What we're doing now is, you know, October time. I mean, I said it. Ross probably sort of alluded to it as well on the pod. We um we couldn't wait for the season to end at that point. <laughs> you know, like just put us out of our misery. But actually, you know, now we're in a, in a situation where we've got two games to really enjoy. Whether we win, lose, or draw doesn't really matter. Be good to get wins, of course. It always is as a football club. But actually, we've we've done what we needed to do. Well, the players have done what they needed to do. But actually, now you know that point about having a successful and thriving football club again. This group of players, the management, everyone connected with the, the club, you know, on, on the playing side particularly, has, has, has now made the fans believe that there's brighter days to come. And that's that's what we want, really, isn't it? 
Um, so yeah, yeah, really, really yeah, good point. It's, it's baby steps, isn't it? We, we've got to take take stock of where we are and hope we can improve on it and, and not think it's, you know, the end of the season means the end of the, the evolution. Yeah, true. Right. Um, <clears throat> Ross, let's come to you. You've been very quiet. Are you all right? I'm doing all right. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to hear what Bobbins had to say. We invite guests on. I want to give them their, their time to shine. Respect. You know? Yeah, Ben. I like that. Yeah, I know. Respectful yeah, is good. Yeah, respectful. Exactly. Um, let's, um, let's talk about some individuals, Ross, because you have today done uh, a very, very good, very clear, very precise analysis of the game in terms of some of the tactics that were utilized. Um, and there's, there's a couple of players I really want to talk about. I mean, what, what do we say about Lewis wing that hasn't been said? We'll start with him first. What can we say about? Yeah. Lewis wing. I thought it was kind of interesting how he was being used. So obviously he's playing as the deepest player as the six at the moment. And last week, um we kind of said yeah that you know he'll, obviously he can do that because he's lewis wing he seems to be able to do anything this season um but maybe we'd want to have him a little bit further forward um but i do think that the way in which um reading were able to play especially in the first half um against barnsley was partly down to the performance of lewis wing and the fact that he was lurking um in the middle right in the middle often in the center circle um waiting basically for barnsley to break out um and he wasn't taking a huge part in the um the press when barnsley were building up from like a goal kick or something like that so a short goal kick out but he was massively important um to what reading wanted to do you know in the press in transition and that he'd be kind of uh challenging for the ball immediately as if it was lost and coming back towards him um and I should say, really, it's a little unfair to say he wasn't helpful in the press and uh, build up uh, when Barnsley were building up as well, because a lot of what Reading were trying to do was trying to force um, Barnsley into the middle. Barnsley really wanted to go wide a lot on on Saturday, but Reading matched up uh, in a sort of like two three press. So you actually have Makairu, um, Smith, uh, and then Aziz on the other side matching up one to one with those uh the back three defenders and lewis wing is kind of all the way at the back of this almost reverse christmas tree so he's almost like the base of the of the the pressing movement it's a it's a one two three um and it just gives reading some solidity i do think that it's nice to have him further forward but obviously he was able to get further forward anyway um as the game went on so not limiting him too much uh in that regard was it a progressive reverse christmas tree it was it was a very uh i would say so yeah because we were winning the ball back over and over again you know we were progressively getting more and more shots off the back of our little uh reverse christmas tree do you guys know what i mean by christmas tree formation yeah, Terry Venables, by the way. About that. i love one of those classic old formation um but yeah no it was sort of a it was sort of a 433 almost um in that 4141 but um yeah flicked really easily into wing at the back um and then you would kind of get Elliot and Nibs uh and then Makairu Smith um and Aziz in front of them and um yeah check out um my Twitter feed and, and the Tyler Stan Twitter feed cuz put out a really good um explainer of kind of how that was yeah, working it was um, all right i mean let's not something to write home about it was it sorry. was okay it's sorry. really good it's a bit of a yeah but, yeah know. yeah We'll save that for Bobby. No, 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 but I just, right, you're right, you're right. I'm more (laughs) excited about it, Reading being really good than me being really good. Listen, I can, like, you know, point at something good happening. Reading, you know, and and James, Oliver Pierce, and Ruben, those are the guys making it happen. So, but yeah, really good coaching, really good execution. Um, And and I think that's why Ruben was disappointed. Yeah. It's it's nice to be disappointed, though, isn't it, on on the pitch? when we know we should have got something from the game or, or, or more from the game. Well, and I, I think as well, he knows this is his, this is what his level has to be next mm-hmm. season. Like if let's say the dream scenario happens, Reading get bought, Reading have something of a summer where they're able to at least hold on to players um, and not, you know, have an exodus again. And so Reading are then competing next season. Um, this season, it's great that we can, you know, smash Carlisle and smash Exeter and then go and get points against Barnsley on the road or whatever. But next season, it'll be expected that we smash basically everyone around us, right? And then point on Barnsley of the road will be like what we want as minimum. So 
Um, I think at the moment, Sellers is sort of using these last few games of the season as a chance to to test the team against where he thinks they are, um, rather than you know the season that they've had so far. I mean, talking of expectations, Bobbins, one player that I wasn't going to mention because we have, you know, on this pod and and in our group chat and everything, I was just obsessed over the the sixes and the eights and whether that's you know that is a six, whether that's an eight, who plays next to wing and all that kind of stuff, but. You know, I, I really don't think we can have this pod talking about the successes against against Barnsley by not mentioning Ben Elliott. Um, do you do you feel that he has reached his potential already, or are we yet to see more of him if he becomes a regular starter? I think you have to say that there's plenty more to come. I mean, you, you you've got to remember this is his first ever professional gig um where he's actually got minutes so he he's had a lot on his plate to adjust to uh, and it's vastly different from the level that he was playing at so yeah i mean it, as, as sellers has said he he's he should have had his place sooner but you know we didn't have that opportunity open up for him really because we were we were playing with a you know a defensive six rather than a playmaker six, so there wasn't really much scope for him because wing was always going to be selected. So yeah, I, there's a there's a lot more that he's got to learn, and I'm sure he's a quick learner. So the, what we've seen recently with his his recent start, he, he's doing his his lovely thing where he lets the ball across his body and you know invites the challenge and away he's gone that that's such a a rare thing that you see at this level that a midfielder's got time that kind of thing can only help us when you've got a talented player like Elliot at our disposal so if we can keep him and then he can only improve he can't go backwards I'm sure I think it's quite interesting just on Elliot that he's let us go back to 4-1-4-1 and what Bobbins was saying there about how earlier in the season we were playing a defensive six in Craig in that 4-1-4-1, I think that's quite interesting and in that we've used the same formation but different aspects of that formation to get the most out of two different youth players this season. So we've taken that defensive six role, chucked Craig in there and given him a bunch of minutes um, you know, to get used to playing that role. And now we've got wing in that position and we're playing Elliot further forward. I think it's quite interesting how we've used you know, the same formation We've returned to the same formation to to give a young player minutes again. Um, yeah, I think there's been a lot of talk, obviously, um, about you know the summer and what that might look like for the club in terms of outgoings rather than incomings. And you know, Lewis Ring would be would be high on anyone's shopping list, in, certainly in terms of League One. I would imagine Championship clubs would be looking at him as well. Um, so I, I guess ultimately the decision lies with with not just him but also the club in terms of. You know, if the takeover happens, the money situation alleviates a little bit, so they won't be, you know, trying to trying to ship players out the door. But playing devil's advocate here, and as much as I don't want it to happen at all, if Lewis Wing did decide to leave, we've still got three players in in and around that position that can kind of you know share the work that he was doing. So I think you know we mentioned this a couple of weeks ago about being really blessed in that department. It's it's almost at the wrong time for us currently because we would wanted to see, and I, I particularly want to see a, a consistent, um, you know, consistent partnership like we've had at centre back for the last couple of months with with that, those positions there as well. It's wing and someone else, so it, it's going to be interesting to see how that pans out and if we can really get some consistency in that position. Really, um, last player that I want to talk about is one of my favourites, uh, Kelvin Abrafer. Made his first start, would you believe, for the club? Didn't know that. I knew he'd started in sort of cup games and stuff, but I thought he'd started in the league at some point. Obviously, that wasn't the case. Um, I like him, Ross, because he does interceptions and he presses. Where did I learn that from? Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, he does. He <laughs> tied up. Um, he linked up very nicely with Aziz, especially, and uh, and Wing and some others in that regards at the weekend. So, yeah, he did really well. He actually won the most defensive duels um, in, in Barnsley's half um on saturday and obviously harvey nibs won the most uh tackles because that's what harvey nibs does he runs around the pitch 
coming ever so ever so close to kicking people but not kicking people actually just nicking the ball away and and, and getting away with it so um quick note on that actually a breffa was number two on that list this week so i think barnsley uh attacked down that side a bunch i think especially in the second half once they you know they had the benefit of being able to say hey we've got a you know, a rookie uh, fullback here to attack. And they, they certainly went down that side a few more times. Um, but he made a lot of good challenges. Um, and, and he also intercepted some plays um, to, to keep the keep the pressure up. So, yeah, Elliot's just got good anticipation. Um, I think that coaching and coordination is important to pressing. But anticipation is as well because you need to predict where the ball is going to end up next. You know, where the... Um, where it is the the player that you're facing up wants to pass it. You need to be able to read their eyes. You need to be able to get yourself in between the the passing lane that they want to to open up. And Elliot was doing a good job of closing those down. He was really important in terms of uh, forcing the defensive midfielders back towards their their center backs. Um, and then uh, him and Aziz together were, were doing a really good job of just forcing uh, Barnsley inside. So yeah, um, really good performance from him in that regard. And, you know, the other the other sentiments that we have who are young in that sort of role being Savage and Craig are ones that we think of as more defensive, especially Craig. But Elliot, um, like I said, the most defensive duels won in Barnsley's half. Um, so in terms of how Ruben wants to play, you know, with a high press and a very energetic style, um, it's working right now. Um, and, and Elliot ha- ha- is profiling well as that kind of player. Well, we've got two games left to play. It'd be interesting who he, he chooses. Obviously, Wing will start both games unless there's something majorly problem in, in terms of injury or whatever. But, you know, I don't see the side yeah. being shaken up too much for those two games personally. Might be wrong. Um, but, you know, you'd like to think that we'll we'll get, you know, maximum points out of out of the last two games. We'll, we'll see what happens. Um, we're going to head into the mailbag. So join us after this short break. We've got quite a, quite a few bits to talk about in that. Um, so we will be back with you in a minute. Keep up to date with all things Reading FC. Follow the Tilehurst End on Facebook and Twitter. This podcast is proudly sponsored by ZCZ Films. Remember, if you want to get involved in sponsoring the show, drop us an email to the Tilehurst End at gmail.com. Uh, big one this week. Lots of uh, lots of jovialness, if that's even a word. And we'll start with uh, Georgie Dawes. Oh, yeah. He says, just wanted to say that you guys have done a great job on covering everything that's happened this year. Thoroughly enjoyed it. It's also the first season listening to your podcast where we haven't been relegated, which is nice. Stop it, George. Honestly, right. we don't come here for compliments, right. although they are always nice. Um, but yeah, no, that's yeah, a, that's we're, a we'll take him though. And that's true. Right? That obviously, if you're, if you're new it to the Tilehurst right? end and you haven't been with us on our 12-year podcasting journey, um, yeah, right. like, you, which we you, haven't either. You're gonna just be to relegated. clarify. Crazy. Um, oh Crazy. dear, here we go. Look, we've we've got we've got a rival podcast here. Argyle Life slash right. Queen and White is that what it is? Yeah, it's basically Plymouth oh Argyle, my, one my, of the Plymouth okay. Argyle podcasts. Um, <laughs> this one's for you, Bobbins, because I saw you replied to this. How much for Aziz? How much? Well, he. In theory, he will cost the uh, the purchaser absolutely nothing because his contract is going to expire. So if he's going to leave, then he's going to leave for absolutely zip. Do you... And um, Let me add to that for you, Bob Benz. Yes. I, I don't think he stays, personally. Uh, no, And neither. I think there might be a reason why Plymouth Argyle podcasts are asking that question. I think, potentially, yes. I don't know. I think. You could be right. Um, do we... How do, how do I word this? Because I like Aziz, I really like Aziz, I know Ross does as well, but in, in the current oh, setup, yeah. can we replace him with what we've got in the squad and will we have to go out and get a replacement for him from somewhere else? Oh, we'll definitely have to go out and get somebody. That's for absolutely sure because i'm sure there'd be many games where femi would need a rest because he's played you know pretty much every every game as far as i can remember so yeah yeah, he would have been replaced at some point if the options were there 
And, you know, we never even did a Ben Elliott where we shoved him out on the right-hand side to give Femi a rest. So that shows the levels that we've got. So the cupboard is bare, I think. So if he does go, then, yeah, we're definitely going to have to get a replacement, if not two, to cover that position sufficiently. Ross, I saw a comment there was at, a the, point... at the weekend about Femi go... Aziz. Um, and I'm just going to ask it bluntly because this is yeah. how it was written. Um, is Femi Aziz overrated? Okay, so, I mean, this is an interesting question. I think that this was Femi's, like, breakout season and that this is the first... I think, like, a couple years ago, we kind of saw those, like, early season goals. I think that was the the 150th season, and he looked pretty good. Um, And then he got injured, obviously, and he was gone for a long time. Then the second season, just injured most of the time or just not getting up to form in the the Poland system. Um, This season's obviously kind of been his breakout. So I don't necessarily know if he's overrated because I'd say that there's only really been one hugely impressive season from him. But he was playing so much better around Christmas that I think now people are comparing it to that. Um, when they say that he may be overrated and he has gone off the boil somewhat since then. So it's kind of interesting, the question about how much he'll cost. Cause like earlier in the season, I was like, especially around January, I was like, we cannot lose Femi if we lose Femi. Yeah. He'll be 8 million pounds, please. Right. Exactly. 8 million pounds. Um, and a new Oracle on the other side <laughs> of the, uh, town, yeah, a second Oracle, the do Oracle, um but um now he's really gone off the boil and i wouldn't be super super surprised if reading don't push crazy hard to keep him um i think that they're very grateful to him for having stayed uh through the past few months but really i think it's the central players that have that's what you're going to build around in my opinion the spine of the team um i think both wide players could be replaced i think reading could go and get as as many as four new wide players uh, in in the off season, if they can afford it, obviously, um, and I think that they need to recruit players um, who are going to put their more central players in good positions because I think they've already shown that they can. Um, what's going on with the the Y players is? I was going to say, let me let me join in with that because there is another question that's literally perfectly primed. Sure, to yeah, add go to ahead. That. So, uh, Peter Martire, okay. long, long-term long contributor to the mailbag. Thank you for everything you've done for us this season, Peter. Uh, he says, with the season almost over and safety secure, thinking of next season, uh, where do you think we need to strengthen and who can we not afford to lose? So, Ross, you, you go with where do we need to strengthen? And then, Bob's, I'm going to come to you for the second sure. part of that. How about that? Sure, sure. Yeah, that makes sense. And so, like, I guess those wide players, yeah, that is the primary thing that we need to strengthen. I think that the spine of the team is pretty solid and and almost sure. pretty decided upon at this stage. Plus, we have, as we've talked about, three young midfielders. Maybe we'll lose one in the off season, but we've got three young midfielders who can um, continue to develop and and continue to ensure that our spine is pretty strong for a while to come. Uh, I think that a lot of how Reading play in the next few years is going to be determined by how good the recruitment is for the wingers um, and how they allow us to play, basically. And I don't necessarily think we need to go and get a bunch of scoring wingers. I think that our fullbacks go inside, so it's more about getting wingers that can hold the width and then maybe also add a little bit of pace to the team. So wingers are are definitely number one for me. For me, it's the left-hand side. Anything on the left-hand side. You know, because I, I, I like mm. Dorset, but we, we need someone to be there consistently. And that's why I'm so good to see a Brafer on, on Saturday in terms of the right-hand side, because for me, he's the future. He's, he's a kind of fullback that I absolutely love in terms of the way that he plays and, and the kind of stuff that he does, not just on the ball, but off the ball as well. Um, Bobbins, who can we not afford to lose apart from Lewis Wing? Tyler Bindon. <laughs> uh, he, he's been such a standout. And, and again, much like Elliot, he can only improve. Um, and his partnership with Mbenge is is something that nobody would have picked out. But but look at it; it it's it's got so much more potential. Um, and I, I think we, if we can keep those two, because I think I think Mbenge's contract is possibly up to. Um, we need to build on 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 that. Get some supplementary 
centre backs in to cover because I think we're probably going to lose <laughs> um, a lot of the remainder that we've got lurking in the background that don't get a kick, thankfully. Um, uh, so, so yeah, I, I would say you know Tyler's the, the standout, but there, there's there's so many that you don't want to lose ideally um, because. Like we said at the outset, we want to build on what we got, not not rebuild from scratch again. Because it's going to be another summer where we're picking up educated scraps, um, and hopefully we're we're still attractive enough for 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 players to to come to Reading and think, yeah, it's not a basket case anymore. We we can uh, we can do good things. I mean, for me, it, it hangs on the speed of the takeover because actually, if I'm a player and I'm thinking, right, we've had we've had a you know a reasonably good end to the season in terms of form. I think we're like fifth over the last six games or something in terms of the form table. You know, it, it would be a project that I'd be looking like going, look, I know the expectations at this football club. I know the fans. I know the expectations of the fans. I know the manager. I know how he wants to play. Like, they're kind of, for a player, you know, they're, they're surely perfect conditions to be able to kick on, really. And even if they say, look, you know, I'll I'll stay, but, you know, might be that I get a bigger move in January or whatever just kind of having that security for us in terms of of the squad and you you know not losing well I mean obviously but naturally we are going to lose players and we need to lose players but the kind of players that we want to keep and the players that have, have played consistent minutes for us you know do, do you think the players will will see something in the potential project Robbins? Yeah I mean you kind of got to look at the players that we attracted last summer um, albeit they were kind of brought in on false pretenses perhaps but all things being equal if if we're in a, a better situation come you know end of may start of june when players are going to be thinking about their next move we're one of the bigger fishes in, in league one and if if that is the level that players want to you know either not finish their career but you know look at spending some some days down in, in league one where they They've got the experience, but they haven't necessarily got the legs anymore. Then we could be attractive. Equally, you know, up and coming players are, are going to be released, um, and, and many other scenarios besides. But we've got to be attractive. We, we've we've still got this this marvelous training ground, unless we can have pinched it again. Um, so there's 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 so many facets to us that should be appealing to players. Um, you know the the stadium, the the whole ethos that we've got there under Celis, um, the the potential of the entire project. There's there's so much that you know many other clubs would still be envious of, but as you say, we've got to sort that ownership issue out very quickly. Otherwise, you know players are going to turn away and think, no, nah, I don't want to be involved in that. It's 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 too dangerous. Yeah, I mean, just to, just to wrap it off, really. I mean, I actually find it easy to answer that question of players. I would, I wouldn't mind leaving the club. Um, you know, Hutchinson, Dean, uh, not you know, not keen on Button as as most people are. Not massively keen on Makairu, to be honest with you. Um, you know, we talked about Aziz already, but you know, you got players like you know Savage, Nibs, Smith, and Bengay is a really good point. You know. I, there is still so much to come from these players, I think, in the in the kind of current unit that we're we're um, we're looking at, and I, I really don't feel that we need a massive rebuild. We need to actually look at the core, which is what we didn't do or couldn't do last season, and just supplement with whatever we can get in terms of, you know, good quality players to, to come through. And for me, it's the goalkeeping department as a priority, and the left hand side in terms of, of of the players that we could get in, but. Look, it's, it's, hopefully it's going to be an interesting summer and it's going to be a positive summer for us and one that we can really kind of, you know, almost count down the days until we get to the start of, of the season in August. So, um, yeah, fingers crossed this is going to be a good one. Um, Real quick, wait, right, one for Sarah you there, Turner, Ben. Lovely. Wait, can I ask you a question, Ben? I know it's not my yeah. mailbag, but would you... Yeah, of course, no one ever does, but you can. I want to ask you a question. Does Joel, and, and Bobbins, I suppose, does Joel Pereira start next season for you? Because for me, I think he does. I think maybe unless you can replace him with someone who you know you can plug in and he's immediately going to be better than whoever, than, than Pereira, I I might start Pereira. And remember, Dean Buzanis started this season for Reading. So goalkeeping can be odd, you know? 
Um, so do you keep Pereira? Do I think he starts Yeah, next does season? Pereira start I... first game of next season? Yeah, I don't see why not. Okay. Bobbins, what do you and, think? Unless, unless Ben Foster comes out of retirement. Right, that's the only thing I was thinking too. You know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bobbins, what no. do you think? Um, Pereira, first game next season? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, there's there's nothing that I've seen in Pereira's game that looks particularly lacking at this level. Right. Uh, and you can see what he gives over and above what Button does. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's it's like night and day, really. And, you know, the, the, the groans could be heard from, heard from Yorkshire when he was had, sadly had to be withdrawn at half time. So... Yeah, I, I can't I haven't got a problem with, with Pereira starting first game next season at all. If we get you know, we we've got so many decent understudies as well that are already at the club, it would be nice to see them given a chance. But I, I get Ben's point that we probably do need another experienced yep. keeper as well. Just to... I, I just think the the consequences of Pereira being number one though, I think Boyce Clark will be off. I think he'll be like, Do you know what I've had enough of this? Um, yeah, I, I really like Harvey Collins. I've seen him play a number of times this season. I really, really like him. I think he's a good, yeah. good yeah. goalkeeper. Like um, is he ready to sit on a bench for a, you know for a League One team? I don't know. I think it, I really don't. Know. I think it's going to be um, Pereira. But I just think those numbers are. Too yeah, good. I mean, the, the, the beauty with goalkeeping is that you just get on with it. Do you know what I mean? Like, if you have to come on and play and go, you just have to get on with it. And we've seen that a number of times over the years with with youth players. So. You know, I, f- to answer your question simply, I, I don't have any issues with Pereira starting number one next season, mate. Yeah, I, I know. I think that's fair. We t- just a brief thing on Pereira. Uh, obviously, we noted um, that Button is way behind his expected goals on target numbers. Just means that he's letting more goals in than he would be expected to. Uh, Pereira has a much smaller uh, sample size. Obviously, he's he's played a lot less, um, but he is already three and a half goals. Uh, over his his total so 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 basically he would have been expected to concede 12 and a half goals he's only conceded nine uh so already he's just trending in the complete opposite direction to to david button basically yeah um talking of trending sarah turner our good friend sarah turner yep. i don't know i keep saying sarah turner it's just sarah isn't it but whatever sorry um, Ruben's dad dancing, which was very much trending over the weekend. Let me tell you over social media. Uh, was it cool or not? Bobbin, do you know a thing or two about dad dancing, don't you? <laughs> not, not even a dad, Ben, let alone dance. Well, you can dance. If he, if he can't dance after we've secured safety, then when can he? Exactly. So I'm all for it. He was, um, it, I was trying to work out what he was dancing to. Maybe uh, Tyler Binden's the... rendition of Sweet Caroline, perhaps, or whatever no, Mbengue's got going on on the largest speaker in... There's a point, if you guys aren't watching Mbengue's uh, live videos, by the way, what is wrong with you? But in any case, there's a point where, you know, they're celebrating the win against Bristol Rovers last week, and Mbengue's walking down the uh, the stadium with the oh. biggest speaker you've seen in your entire life. It's bigger than the trash can that a Brafer then starts dancing on. So just go, go check that out. It's, it's definitely worth seeing. He's, um, he's definitely come out of a shell, isn't he? Bless him. Mbenge. Do we think Mbenge yeah. had a shell? Yeah. I'm not so sure. I think Mbenge was always a, I, a volatile yeah, substance, I, you know, he's great. Do, do, well, I say that, and I don't. Again, I, I was I did this with Tim last week. And I don't want to be that guy, but I've, I'll do it again. I've I've actually been to yoga classes with him, Benga. Oh yeah, and he's 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 very you know he's he's very calm with it. Obviously, you have to be in yoga. So um, yeah. So that's why I'm a bit like, where's this guy come from? Right. You know, so what uh, a man. But yeah, look, it's 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 all good. It's all good. And I I for what it's worth, I like the dance, and I thought it was it was good. He did a better job than I could anyway. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, exactly. Bobbins, this is one we're going to come to you again as a bit of a pattern, but we have to ask you this legally. Uh, we were going to ask you anyway, but uh, Naf <laughs> has chipped in with a question. Oh, God. Do, do you know what's um, coming? No, I don't know, but it's math, so it could literally could be anything. We, 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 Ross has made it like law that we have to ask people this anyway. Right. Um, would you rather be a cod or a haddock? Uh, um... Cod. I'll go for Why? cod. Yeah. What's the reasoning? 
I've I've just got more of an affinity with cod and okay. haddock, really. <laughs> nice. Okay. We've had location. What do you mean affinity? What does that right. mean? Like you just you've met one. <laughs> I've just met. Like, I've probably never eaten haddock right. in my life. Okay. It's all right, actually. I don't eat a lot of fish. Ah, I don't okay. eat a lot of fish, so you know. Do you not eat a lot of fish because cod. it's been in the sea? You, you you literally don't know where they've been, do you? That's true. <laughs> This is becoming a very interesting Bile. anthropological question because now we've had affinity, uh, we've had location, uh, we've had expensiveness of the fish uh, as a reason yeah. for for giving an answer. So this is this is actually very interesting, you know. Are you, are you writing all these answers down? Yeah, I'm I'm writing a long thesis about them. Don't you worry, <laughs> the cod or the haddock thesis. <laughs> oh God. Oh, cod, even actually. Oh, cod, oh, yeah. God. Had it, one of Thank you, Matt, for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, SP37 sounds pretty cryptic, but this is a really good question. This is one for you, actually, Ross. All right. Uh, how many times did we dispossess slash intercept slash win the second ball? Um, I guess against Barnsley. A lot. And if you don't have those stats, then you can't call yourself a stats man. I know. I mean, I don't have those uh, right off the the top of my head. I'm I'm afraid it was a lot. Basically, it was it was it was um, especially in the first half, especially around sort of. If you're watching back, I think you can go on Royals TV and it's already up there, the full game replay or whatever. Um, go and plug yourself into minutes ten to thirty. Um, and you'll have a lovely old time as a Reading fan. Let's just put it that way. It was a lot. I don't know the exact number. Is a lot a number? Okay. Um, so, yeah, well, I suppose it is, isn't it? But yeah. you've given a time index, which is probably even better than a number. Right, yeah. Go and watch, go and watch can, those 20 minutes in the first half, and you'll have a nice time. Um, second part of the well, it's not really, it's a statement, but I'm going to turn it into a question because I'm a really skilled host nice. of pods. Um, he says Lewis Wing looks like prime time John Swift on his day. Um, Bobbins, if you had to choose Lewis Wing or John Swift, who would it be and why? Uh, Lewis Wing because he's a bit more rounded as a midfielder. He he does put away those shit pingers like uh, like Swift could back in the day, but I think he's um, he's got a bit more to him. He doesn't look like a walking yellow card like Swift used to be when he was, you know, dispossessed and beaten for pace. Yep. Lewis can can fight his own corner, I think. Um, yeah. It's it's a tricky one, but yeah, Wing would edge it for me. That Physically, is a really good he's question. stronger as well, isn't he? Yeah, he's stronger than he looks. Wing, you, you don't think he's he's gonna, you know, hold off, uh, you know, a lot of midfielders in this division, but. He, he certainly puts himself about a bit. And, you know, I remember one of his first games where he actually injured himself. He went in for a thunderous challenge and Swift wouldn't do that in a, in a million years. So, um, yeah, the the king of winged for me. He, he likes a tackle, doesn't he, Lewis Wing? He does like a tackle. Oh, he, he's done shirk, done shirk. No, well, he's just a big lad too. I reckon he probably weighs about, what, two stone more than John Swift, honestly. Carries it well though, doesn't he? Yeah. He does. Yeah, he yeah. No, I just it. noticed it. Maybe it's because um, Barnsley were a smaller team. I don't know. I'm talking out my arse there. But when I was watching <laughs> it back, I was like, "Cool, Lewis Wing's a big lad, isn't he? He is a big yeah. lad." So yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the mailbag done and dusted. We're gonna we're gonna head off to the preview where we go to uh, Burton Albion. So uh, the Pirelli Stadium is it still called the Pirelli Stadium? I think it is, isn't it? I think so. I don't know. I'll, I'll Google yeah. it in the break. We'll be back in, in two seconds. There's another huge game ahead for the Royals. So be loud and be proud for the big match preview. It is indeed the Pirelli Stadium that we are off to on Saturday, the 20th of April. So this Saturday. Um, I mean, it's... It, listen, Bobbins, it's, it's enjoyable to know that we can go to that game and... and you know, obviously, we always care about the results. It's our football club. We want to win and we want to pick up points. But actually, there's no pressure now, really, is there, in terms of, uh, you know, what we can do. Um, it's also inflatables, which is uh, always a, uh, just a stunning day out. Absolutely fantastic. And the fact that we're safe, the fact that it's a sold-out away end, yet again, we keep saying this on previews, but it is another sold-out away end um, up, at, up at Burton, um, means that we can just kind of enjoy it, really. 
Um, Burton can uh, legally and mathematically still stay up in the league. The last three games they've got are obviously Cheltenham at home tomorrow, which is a massive game at the bottom there. Um, us at home on Saturday. And they got Fleetwood away on the final game of the season on the 27th at, at 12.30. Um, I guess the, the first question really, Bobbins, is uh, do you do you think changes will happen to the starting eleven uh, for the game against them? I think only enforced changes, um, if there are any injuries. Uh, I don't see a need to change it. I think if if we had a you know a, a defeat, then you could possibly entertain it. But there's no reason to. I don't think the players certainly didn't look tired um, like they have done in some away games. So. Yeah, I I think keep the momentum going with what you've got. I, I'd like to see more of a breather for sure. Definitely want to see Elliot in in the position that he's been allowed to. Um, yeah, yeah, just yeah, keep on keeping on. I think it just um, it would serve them well to to go into the last game full of beans still. Yeah, I think it's um, it, looking at the bottom of the table, it, it's it's very tight for some of those teams. You know, you, Carlisle obviously gone. Um, it, I mean, it's not impossible for Fleetwood to to stay up, but they've got one game less to play than Cheltenham have, who bizarrely have got two games in hand. Um, I mean, in in terms of Burton Ross, do you do you expect them yeah. to be behaving or, or or playing like rabid badgers? Do I expect them to be, play like rabid badgers? I mean. Can I expect them to play very energetically without expecting them to play like rabid badgers? Or is that a prerequisite here? Yeah. That's if fine. You could, okay. If yeah. you compare them to an animal potentially for the game, how would you expect them to play? Mm. Um, I do like the idea of honey badgers. I mean, they're yellow, aren't they? I would say they're going to be going for it because this is pretty much going to be their... Um, their chance, right? To, to really secure... I mean, they could... So if they beat Cheltenham they're basically going to be safe. So that'll be their chance, you know, at home to have one good moment with their fans. That said, I don't think Reading are in the mood to let up right now. Um, so I think that, you know, if they are energetic, they'll be meeting energy with energy. Um, I just think that Sellers' teams, I, I don't know. Like, I don't feel like Reading can really operate in the style of play they want to use without being energetic. I don't think this style of play works without it, I guess, is what I'm saying. So, um, yeah, maybe they'll come out like a honey badger, but I think that that's kind of Reading steel right now under Sellers. So I'm excited to see how it happens. I think, it, I think honestly, it'll be a good game of football um, because they should be either excited, you know, because they've just stayed up or really needing to go for it. And, and, and Reading are just playing some good stuff right now. So it should be an exciting one. I think if Cheltenham get the win tomorrow night, it, it's going to be, it's, it's going to be tasty. incredibly tense for those clubs. And and one team that I didn't really uh, spot, I've just kind of you know gone under the radar for me is Shrewsbury, and they're currently sat yeah. forty six points, you know, along with Cambridge as well. But Cambridge have got a game in hand over Shrewsbury, so that's going to be an interesting one to watch. The other thing that I didn't realise until I was having a look, you know, in, in prep for this pod, which I do do sometimes. Um, of, over the last six games, from the bottom up, you've got Bristol Rovers, Barton Albion, Cheltenham, Shrewsbury, Fleetwood. So yeah. that, that just tells you that, you know, there are four teams out of those five or six that are only heading one way in terms of their form at the moment. And Burton, to yeah. be fair to them, you know, they've they've got two home games. Tomorrow night is absolutely huge. And then obviously us. Um you know, on Saturday. So if I'm honest, I'm actually quite glad that, that we're well away from this now because it's it's very tense. You know, Port Vale obviously still very much in the mix. Um, Fleetwood could could mathematically still get out of it as well. And that's that's just horrible right. for some of those clubs really because you know they're they're not they're not the biggest as it is. And so dropping down into League Two would be absolutely catastrophic for some of those clubs. So yeah, it's it's gonna be very, very difficult. Um and then I guess, you know, we, we look towards the Blackpool on the last game of the season where, you know, <laughs> they're, they're still in with a shout of, of getting in the playoffs as well. So, you know, we're, we're playing two teams that, that really have to have to bring the game to us than, rather than the other way around. Um, what, 
you know, looking at those last two games, what would you, I'll come to you first, Bob, and be happy with in terms of a points haul from those, you know, from those remaining two fixtures? It's a bare minimum of two, I, I would say. Um, we sh- we should certainly be in a good position to beat Burton, mm-hmm. but you know they they had a good result at the weekend as well. So you know, as you say, they're going to be fighting. So we need to be on it to make sure that we're not going to be um, you know some some fall guys for them. We certainly don't want to be playing into their hands. And for the last game, surely they're going to want to end up on a high. And, and as you say, it's not going to be easy because Blackpool have got a lot to play for. Um, we'll know more after um, Burton's next game, as you say. Um, sorry, Cheltenham's game uh, against them. Um, and again, Blackpool as well. So you know, we'll have a we'll, we'll have our say. And but I certainly don't think that Sellers will be saying to 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 any of them for either game. Yeah, just treat this as a little bit of a training session he won't allow that i don't think that's in his in his style he'll always want us to go out and win every game regardless yeah, that's a good I point, think. especially after the certainly the you know the troubles we had this season and particularly the start we had you know he want to finish on as, as high as possible to I, I guess to prove to himself and and you know to the players that we're, we're still in it and we can still affect you know what happens in the league um ross you know we, we win both those games best case scenario the highest we can end on is 56 points, which would take us to 13th. Very, very unlikely that we would finish in 13th, given other you know results and position changes. But it is you know a remote possibility. Um, 56 points would be pretty impressive from the season we've had, right? You couldn't really ask for more than that. No, I don't. I mean, like we said at the start of the season, um, I think like we had different predictions for how it would go, but I think that we both thought. <clears throat> It'd be a slow start, um, and then we'd maybe pick things up. And I think that a lot of Reading fans, especially in October, would have liked for Reading to make some changes, like ask, like for Sellers to make some changes quicker to get us into that four one four one and get us really on the road to competency and um, you know improvement. But I think that as long as we got on that road this season on the playing side, that was the most important thing. And I think that we now have. So I would say that given how bad this season got uh, off the field, it got probably worse than we even expected. We knew it wasn't going to be amazing, but um, I think there were some ideas that maybe going down to league one would be a a new start. Obviously it wasn't Um, maybe now in the off season, uh, if we do get this um, ownership situation sorted out quickly, um, then we can start looking up. But yeah, I'd say with this year, um, given that we thought it would be a slow start and then what, I, I think I said 10th at the start of the season. So we're not going to finish there. Um, I don't think we clicked into gear um, or, or got going as soon as we maybe should. But um, yeah, no, I think this was a pretty impressive season given the circumstances and i think if you look around the national media and you know the guys that aren't reading fans first and foremost um one of the main questions that's being asked is are you going to be able to keep sellers and that's partly down to you know the new ownership group and that's partly down to do other people come sniffing around him now um so yeah i I think it's been a i think it's been a very good return this season especially since november right yeah, I mean, you know, I think since we lost to Shrewsbury, if you if the season started from that point on, we'd be what fourth, fifth, maybe. Based yeah, on the points we've had, something is, like that. It's quite and incredible. The goal get. scoring's insane. Like the so the entertainment levels up and um, just yeah, versus where we are versus a year and a half ago, it's a it's a very it's a far sight in terms of on the field. <laughs> well, we shall see. We will be um, we'll be back next uh, probably a week today potentially. Uh, talk about the the game against Burton Albion and also to preview what will be our very last game of the season against Blackpool at home. Lots of cool stuff happening. Um, I know that Renegade Brewery have have changed the name of their beer to uh, El Jefe. El Jefe? Is it? What is it, Bob's? Jefe. El Jefe. El Jefe. Yes, El Jefe. That, that's pretty exciting. Um, yeah, there's, there's going to be loads of stuff going on for Blackpool. It's going to be a real real party atmosphere and I'm 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 really really excited for it as as it will be on on Saturday against Burton Albion. Um, just before we go, uh, two very quick things. If you are one of our lovely listeners that ran the Red and Half Marathon yesterday, or on Sunday, if you're listening to this on Wednesday, for example, uh, congratulations, really, really well done. A lot of people have told me that I know that yeah. run that said that the best part was was running into the um, the Stad, the SCL, and I honestly 
can't disagree with them. It is one of the best places on the planet, let me tell you. And the second thing, and I know that we have a bit of a weird thing with Port Vale going on, but you know, based on on just our relationship with with Mark Foster, who came on, uh, not Mark Foster. What am I talking about? Mark Porter. Mark Foster's Mark Porter, the Olympian, yeah. isn't he? Mark Porter. Um, he came on earlier this season. That pod is still available if you if you want to have a listen to that and as a back issue. Um, based on on the relationship we have with him alone, even though I got his <laughs> name wrong, sorry, Mark, if you listened. Um, <laughs> we you know we we're really really keen for you guys to to stay up. And so that we can, you know, continue our friendship next season on the pitch as well. But um, really, really best wishes for your remaining games, and we hope that you know Darren Moore can can get you guys out of it and and stay up, and, and we can see you on the pitch next season. Um, Bobbins, talking of seeing you again soon, we calculated we've got three months without any football in terms of Reading, so we have got oh, we've got a lot of don't. ideas for the summer in terms don't. of pods. So you will definitely be getting a knock on your virtual door to come on again and discuss just random stuff, basically. My door will be open. Fantastic. And as always, if you haven't read them, and I don't know what you're doing if you haven't read them, but after every game, Bobbins does five things, and it's it's incredibly good uh, reading. So please get on those. They're on the website. Uh, I think they're on the Facebook page, actually, and they will be on X as well. So um, have a look for those. Ross, I know you're doing some stuff. You just put out a thread on on Barnsley, um, which is really yep. really good. And you've got some other things as well. We're gonna have to do a tactical pod as well for April, aren't we? I have to get thinking. About All that. kinds of fun bits and bobs. Yeah, we'll do some sort of tactical pod um, at the end of the season. But I know that we've got the uh, season end things coming in soon as well. So I'm deep in the Tyler Binden war rooms, uh, creating a a video on his candidacy. Mm-hmm. Um, I, so yeah, so look forward to that. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining me on this uh, you know, glorious Monday evening in, in Reading, in RG31, where I'm sat. Um, have a really, really good week, everybody. If you're going up to Burton on Saturday, enjoy it. I want to see loads of random inflatables. Sensible, though, nice and safe and not disrespectful, because, uh, you know, we'll all get told off. And uh, if you're not going to that, we will see you against Blackpool on the 27th, 12.30 kickoff, that one. Tickets are still available. And I think you can still vote for your player of the season as well. So uh, have a little go on that one. And, and hopefully we can uh, all celebrate in style on that Saturday on the, the final game of the season. Have a really good week. Take care. Thank you for listening as always. Come on, you are.